So there's a, uh, there's a device that right now, a piece of technology that's hanging on the wall in your home, in your apartment, that is causing more division, more turmoil than you're probably willing to admit. And the device that I'm referring to is this uh, right here. Okay, okay, we got an honest man on the front. Come on, how many of you are willing to admit that when it comes to the temperature of your home, you live in a house divided? You live in a house divided online, you can participate. Okay, this is great. I just, I just figured since it's Father's Day, we're just going to go for it, all right? Um, here's what I've learned about um, a home divided when it comes to the temperature. There really are three categories of people, one of which we all fall into. You have cold, warm, <laughs> and you have cheap, Okay. So let's just figure out who's who, all right? How, how many of you, when it comes to your house, do you prefer, prefer it to be colder? Colder, especially at night, at night when you sleep, cold, cold. Yeah, 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 this is great. Um, this, is, this is my wife, by the way, which I'm blessed because I like a cold room. It could be 95 degrees outside in the summer, and she wants me to buy an air conditioning w- w- a unit for the window. Like, yes, we have central AC. I'm like, babe, I don't think the HOA who writes me a letter when my trash can is out too long. He's going to allow us to put a box on the front part of our house. Uh, so she likes it. She likes it to be cold, so do I. All right, so how many of you, though, you, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a little thin-blooded. You get cold easily. You bring a jacket wherever you go. So you prefer the home to be a little warmer. Not hot, just warmer. Okay, look around, look around. All right, I don't want to stereotype. A lot of ladies. That's cool. If you're a dude, it's fine. Don't, don't, don't hate, all right? This is fine. Um, we're glad you're here. Then there's this third category, and you're like, I don't really care what the temperature is. I don't even care what the people in my house think about the temperature, because I am economically responsible, a.k.a. you're cheap. You're cheap. Where are my cheap people at? <laughs> Look at this. A lot of dudes. A lot of dudes. Okay, okay. I don't know what's happening online, but that's what's happening in the house. Um, now, here's the thing. If, if I was to take a poll, and I was to ask you, and, and don't do this out loud, how, who in the home sets the temperature? I would be willing to guess that the majority, not everybody, but the majority, it would be the man, the husband. Now, let me work out my, my theory, okay? Um, we can eliminate the children because there's no way you're giving thermostat rights to the little people in your house who do not pay the bills, who will not pay the utilities, and who do not contribute to your bottom line, So we can eliminate the kids. Um, I think it's safe to say we can eliminate friends, right? Like I'll go into a friend's house, and if I know you pretty well and I feel comfortable, I'll open up your fridge, and I'll just help myself to a drink. If I know you really well, I'll even sit down on your couch and change the channel on your remote control. But I would never think in a million years to walk into someone else's house and start messing with their thermostat. (laughs) What kind of weirdo would do something like that? That's what I'm saying. So, so really, it just comes down to the husband, the wife, the man versus the woman. And the reason why I think dominantly it is the man who sets the temperature is because the women let us. Like, ladies have more important things to worry about than a few degrees on the thermostat. Come on, ladies, like managing your career, managing the kids, managing the house. And because women are so smart and you're so intuitive, you know that us men, we need to feel valued and we need to feel needed. So you give us the thermostat. There it is, sir. There it is. You thought it was because I'm the man of the house. Shoot, you ain't no... Let me, let me put it like this. If, now, if you're a smart man, you set it to the degree that your wife wants. So here's the bottom line. You ready? If you don't get anything out of that church, get this. The man might set it, but it's the wife who controls it. Come on, where are my ladies at today on Father's? I'm preaching gospel truth, good news truth right here. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, today. Today on Father's Day, we're closing out a study on the life of King David. It's really a four-part conversation. This is like the last episode of a Netflix series if you're walking in for the first time, a series that we just simply titled The Rise and Fall of a King. And so what we've been doing is looking at Israel's greatest king, a man after God's own heart, the the writer of most of the book of Psalms, this incredible hero and, and warrior and poet and lover and fear of God, yet in the midst of that, David would experience the fall of failure. And although David would be... Israel's greatest king, um, he might be Israel's worst father. He could manage the throne, but he could not manage his own home. David's biggest downfall might have been his bad parenting. And I would say that David is the one who set the temperature for the rest of his family. 
And what I'd like for you to see today, sir, is that you are the one that sets the emotional and the spiritual temperature of your house. That you might be the biggest influencer of the climate control of your home. I would even say to you that your wife and your kids are responding to the temperature that you're setting. Yeah, I know. So if your wife is acting cold towards you, it might be because that's the temperature that you set. If your house is filled with rules and fear and legalism, it might be the reason why your kids are responding to you the way that they are. Because you are the one that influenced the temperature probably more than anybody else. And every home has a temperature. So, so if your house is unstable, unsettling, nerve-wracking, anxious, or if your home is loving, grace-filled, a sanctuary, safe enough to be vulnerable, I believe it's a direct result of the temperature that you've set. Now, if your uh, home is anything like the royal family in 2 Samuel chapter 13, then might I suggest that you need to adjust the temperature of your house. So if you got a Bible, let's go back to the Old Testament one more time. 2 Samuel chapter 13 is where we're going to land today. 2 Samuel chapter 13. And I, I feel like I just got to give a disclaimer. I got to warn you. Um, this chapter is a mess. It's a mess. It's one of the hardest chapters in all of 1 and 2 Samuel. This chapter is filled with lies, deceit, lust, rape, murder, and a father who stands by and does nothing. And so today... Uh, for all the men in the room, I want to speak to you around this thought right here. Play the man. Play the man. If there's one thing I can encourage you on Father's Day, whether you're currently a father or not, just for all the men, that you got to play the man. And what we've seen over the last couple weeks with David sleeping with another man's wife, Uriah, covering it up, having him killed. Last week, Pastor Crockett did a phenomenal job talking about the fallout of failure and how your sin never just impacts you, like, like your sin impacts those around you. Sin is never individual, it's always communal. And we're gonna see today, right in front of us, what happens when a man doesn't play the man. Now let me show you where I get this from. Uh, it was actually the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, by the way, who was never married, who never had children. Here's what he wrote to a church in Corinth. He said this in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 16, verse one, or verse 13. He says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. This phrase, act like men, in the original Greek language, literally translates, play the man. So, so Paul writes a letter to a group of churches in Corinth, and, and this church was out of control. Like, you thought woke was a new thing? No, 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 no. It, it, it's been an ancient thing. I mean, they were allowing so many secular and pagan ideologies into the bride of Christ, into the local church, that Paul takes a moment in the book of Corinthians just to call out the dudes. Like, this makes me kind of like stand at attention a little bit. And he's actually holding them accountable for what they are allowing to take place right there in their own church. And he looks at me and says, guys, you got to stop playing, quit, quit playing the boy, quit acting like a child, and you need to step into the fullness of who God's created you, play the man. So today we're just going to do a Bible study, just a, just a quick little Bible study through 2 Samuel chapter 13. I want to introduce you to four men in the royal family who do not play the man. And then at the very end, I want to give you some practical handles on what it really means to step in to biblical manhood. So um, let's go with this together. 2 Samuel chapter 13, let's start in verse 1. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. If you need more time, say, hold up. Okay, here we go. I always wonder if someone's going to say, hold up. Verse 1 says, in the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, the son of David. Amnon became obsessed with his sister Tamar, that he made himself ill. Now, she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. All right, so the first character of investigation is David's oldest son, Amnon. Now, now, the fact that Amnon is the oldest son tells us a few things. It tells us that he is next in line to take the throne. And Amnon apparently is in love with his half-sister, Tamar. Everyone say, that's gross. It is. It is. It's gross. Like, same daddy, different mamas. But here's what you got to remember. This is Old Testament, Old Covenant. It, it, you can't try to compute that into our day today. It's why when you read the Old Testament, it's filled with polygamy and, and multiple wives and incest and murder. But it is important to know that even in the midst of that, God never wanted this. 
Deuteronomy 17, 17, you can go read it. It says that God wanted Israel's king to have one wife. But Israel's kings, including David, wanted to be like all the other kings and abuse their power and have a trophy shelf of women. And it did not end good. Okay, back to Amnon. So Amnon apparently is in love with Tamar, but, but Tamar doesn't give him the time of day. Tamar doesn't look at him. He's spitting game. She, she's not picking up what he's dropping. He's doing the pickup lines, and, and it just begins to fuel his lust for her even more. So Amnon represents a guy who has, he has desire without discipline. And look, men, when you have desire, but you have no discipline, it is a recipe for disaster, I said desire without discipline is a recipe for disaster. That just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you want something doesn't mean that that something is good for you. And if you have desire but you have no self-discipline, the very thing that you desire can actually dominate your life. And desire in and of itself is not a bad thing. I would say most of the desires that you have are probably from God. We're just fulfilling them in illegitimate ways. Like your desire for intimacy, your desire for sex, that's from God. That's good. But if you're fulfilling it in illegitimate ways, it'll always cause destruction. I feel like as a man, yeah, I feel like as a man, your desire for achievement and accomplishment and your desire to succeed in life, that's from God. But if you're trying to find your value in your paycheck, in your company, in your title, you will never feel worthy. For your worthiness can only be determined by the God who paid for your life through Jesus. So, so, so you're right. so, you see what I'm saying? So desires are not bad. But when you have no discipline, it can damage your life. So let's go back to the church in Corinth. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul said this. He said, he goes, but I discipline my body, and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. <laughs> Paul's like, look, I got to discipline my desires. I got to check my flesh. I got to make sure that I'm not going to do something that's going to disqualify the ministry that God has on my life. And I love Paul because Paul's like, look, I want to be set apart, used by God for the great work that the Lord has for me. I want to I wanna be marked by grace, marked by compassion, marked by humility and gentleness. I don't want anything to disqualify the call and the purpose that God has on my life. That desire without discip- discipline always leads to destruction, and I would say that an undisciplined man is a dangerous man. It's the reason why 89% of all violent crime committed in America is committed by men. You've got desire, but we have no discipline. Amnon is about to be uh, a statistic, for he devises this plan, and he draws his sister into the room. He forces himself onto her, And she, of course, does not want this. Look as the text continues, verse 14. But she, Tamar, refused, I'm sorry, but he, Amnon, refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than her, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. So Amnon, Amnon got what he wanted only to realize that what he wanted wasn't what he actually wanted. Amnar was not, Amnon was not in love with Tamar. He was in lust with Tamar. Yeah, yeah, he loved the chase. He loved the pursuit. He loved the hunt. And, and I just feel like we've got too many men who want the thrill of the chase, but we don't want the responsibility of the relationship. And, and that's why we live in a fatherless nation. It's why so many kids are going to go to bed without even knowing who their dad is because you want the thrill of the chase, but you don't want to bear the responsibility of the relationship. It's, is it tense in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, look, listen, as a dude, I get this. When I have desire, but I don't, I don't have self-discipline, other people always get hurt. Amnon did not play the man. Now, Amnon did not devise this plan by himself. Um, This whole plan to seduce Tamar was actually helped to him by his cousin, Jonadab. So in walks the second character of investigation who did not play the man. And Jonadab represents a guy who has wisdom without principle. So let's continue to read. Verse 3, now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shema, David's brother. So this is his cousin. Jonadab was a, a very shrewd man. And he asked Amnon, why do, you, um, why do you, the king's son, look 
so haggard morning after morning. Won't you tell me, Amnon said to him, well, I'm in love with Tamar, my, my brother Absalom's sister. Okay, so, so here's the scene. You have, you have cousin Jonadab, and you have his, um, his cousin Amnon. And he looks at him, and he's like, cuz, why, you always look so distraught. What's, what's going on, man? He's like, man, it's a girl. He's like, yeah, I figured. It's always a girl, right? He's like, yeah, man, I just, you know, this girl, her name's Tamar, and, and like, I'm trying to, you know, like, get her to notice me, but I don't, I don't you know, I can't get her to notice me. And, and Jonadab's like, bro, I got you. I got a plan. H- how about we do this? Why don't, re- when you read the whole text, you'll see it. Why don't we act like you're sick, like really sick? And you know that your father, King David, is going to come in, and you're the next heir to the throne. He will do anything medically to make you better. So, so, so when he comes in, tell him that what you really need is to be nursed by Tamar. And then when Tamar comes in and the door is closed, have your way. And, 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 and so immediately they get into this, and Jonadab's like, all right, here's I'm, I'm going to order you a, an electric blanket on Amazon, and we're going to get your external body temperature up to like 103 degrees, and I got some makeup. I'm going to make your face look real pale. What do you think? And Amnon's like, okay, that sounds great. These two, you know these two jokers remind me of? These two right here. I mean, they are the, they are the original dumb and dumber of the Old Testament, Okay. Like, this is Harry and Lloyd, all right? Like, you know, like, like Harry goes up to Lloyd, and, and just as Jonab goes up to Amnon, he's like, I got this great idea. And he's like, so you're saying there's a chance. Now, here's the truth. Um, um, <laughs> bad advice never yields a good result. Bad advice never yields a good result. Uh, next Sunday, um, I'm really excited. We're stepping into a summer teaching series through the book of Proverbs, Interestingly enough, Solomon, one of David's sons, wrote the majority of the book of Proverbs. It's known as wisdom literature in the Old Testament. So we're calling the series Summer of Bad Advice. And you see the inverse of what we're going to do because we've all received bad advice. And what I've learned is that bad advice never produces a good result. Now, here's the truth, though, about Jonadab. Jonadab was not dumb. Jonadab was shrewd. He was sharp. He was, he was smart. He could devise a plan, carry out the plan, even if it caused damage onto somebody else. I'd like to present to you today that Jonadab might be the most dangerous man in the royal family fiasco because he was skilled without conviction. He, he, he had knowledge, but he had no morals. He had insight but he had no integrity. And when a man is that shrewd and that skillful and that sharp and they use it for evil, the domino effect is beyond anything that you could think of. Catastrophic impact would take place. As David, as, as David's nephew tries to divide the family. Now, as bad as those first two guys are, the one that I hold personally the most accountable is David. Not, not King David in this sense, but, but, but rather Father David. I mean, at this point, he has a son in Amnon who is out of control. He has a nephew in Jonadab who's dividing the family. And the most importantly, he has a daughter in Tamar who has been deeply wounded. So the question is, is what's dad going to do? What would you do? Well, let's read. Verse 21. When King David heard all this, blank. Let me ask you, all the dads in the room, what would you do? If you found out that your daughter had been raped, had been abused, had been hurt on this level, what would you fill in that blank? I'm going to tell you right now, what I, for me, like I would have to start a prison ministry. Because I'd be behind, I would start life point behind bars. That's what I'd have to do. Don't, don't underestimate how much I love my daughters. Look. I'm going to tell you right now, and there isn't a dude in this room who I know would not do whatever it takes to validate and to, and to defend their daughter or their son. What would, what would you do? Well, here's what David did. It says, as the text goes on, when King David heard all this, he was furious, period. That's it. He got mad, but David did nothing. David represents a guy who has anger without action. He has anger, but he does nothing about it. He has a daughter who is broken and desperately needs her daddy, and he looks the other way. He has a son who is out of control, and he passively 
turns around. I think one of the greatest problems in our day to day are passive men who will not take responsibility, who won't step in and make the hard decisions, who leave all the disciplinarian in, uh, up to their wives, who won't, who won't shoulder the responsibility, instead shove everything to the side. I think, I think the greatest problem in our nation, uh-oh, I'm going to go on a soapbox real quick, it's not politics, it's not policies, it's not world, secular worldism infiltrating our culture. I think the greatest problem with our nation is passive men who won't do anything. Look, if we want to make America great again, we got to make men men again. And I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about dominating and being domineering. Don't, don't ever misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about men who are active in their faith, men who are active in their relationship with Jesus, men who actively engage in the body of Christ, the local church. It's why when I look around this campus and I see men parking cars and greeting doors and running sound and loving on kids and Discovery Point, I, I, just, I think that's the, one of the greatest examples that you can set to your family, that as a dude, you've got to reject passivity and you've got to be active in your faith. It's why as a church, we have a heart to reach men. Unapologetic, we have a heart to reach men. And I'll tell you why. All the statistics will point to the same thing. If you reach a woman for Christ, which I'm not talking about value, you know that. But if you reach a woman for Christ, there's an 18% chance that the family, including the husband, will attend church. If you reach a teenager, this is interesting, there's a 33% chance that the family and the husband and the wife will come to church. If you reach, if you reach a man for Jesus, 88% chance that his family's gonna come to church. I'm just not okay. Sitting on the sides, Watching men as a rite of passage for a boy finally reach an age where they can stay home with dad and not go to church. Yeah, God has called you to something greater. And look, I know you didn't have the example in your earthly father. Maybe for you that's the biggest thing. You just didn't, you didn't see it modeled in your home. But you know what? As a follower of Jesus, we, we don't have the excuse, do we? Because we got the greatest example in our heavenly father. Like you do know that Jesus is the embodiment of what biblical manhood looks like. I mean, on one hand, he was compassionate, he was kind, he was gentle, he was patient. But then on the other side, he was sacrificial, he was meek, he was strong. It was the, it was the strength of Jesus that took on my responsibility, your responsibility when he went to a cross and he died for me and for you. And then on the third day, he rose from the grave. And I'm telling you, what came out of that grave was not a lamb, it was the lion. It was strength. It was courage. It was determination. And the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the grave is the same spirit that lives in you. So you, sir, in Christ, have everything that you need to be the man that God's called you to be. David had anger, but he had no action. And really what should have led to a righteous result led to nothing. His son, Amnon should have been thrown into prison. His daughter should have been vindicated and restored. And instead, he does nothing. Well, Absalom is the fourth character of investigation. Absalom, the other son of David, also a brother of Tamar. He decides, well, if dad's not going to do anything, I'll do something. But look what Absalom does. Verse 23, take a breath. We're going to read about six verses. It says this. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shears were at Baal Hazar near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. And Absalom went to the king and he said, your servant has had shears come. Will the king and his attendants please join me? So he's inviting his dad to the dinner party. It's the time where we shear the sheep and take all the wool. This is like a harvest season. It's a time to party. In verse 25, David says, no, my son, the king replied, all of us should not go. We would only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he, David, still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, if not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, why should, why do you want your brother there? And Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's sons. And Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and they fled. So <laughs> I hope this encourages you because you're like, man, I was feeling like my family was pretty dysfunctional until today. This is 
Like, I've been to some dysfunctional Thanksgivings, but nobody killed anybody. Literally killed anybody. Um, yeah, so Absalom was like, that's fine. I love my sister enough, Dad, if you're not going to do nothing. He devises this, this what, what did it say, two-year plan? For two years, he devised this plan, and finally the moment was right, and Abnon comes into the big feast, the shearing of the sheep. It's a big celebration, and at that moment, his men kill his brother Amnon, and the rest of David's sons flee. Here's what this man represents. Absalom has revenge, but no restraint. As a man, are you filled with revenge? Are you filled with anger from your past, the injustice? That feeling isn't bad, but, but do you have restraint? What, what's the revenge going to lead to? I, I can just give you a shadow of Absalom's life. If you read the rest of 2 Samuel, here it is in a, in a paraphrase. David would find out about this, that Amnon was dead by the sword of his brother. David would, would kick Absalom out of the kingdom. Three years would pass. Absalom would beg to come back to the kingdom to see his father, and David finally allowed his son to come, but he did not want to see him. This only made Absalom more and more angry and resentful towards his dad. And finally, Absalom started to devise this plan. He's like, that's fine, dad. If you're not going to accept me, then I'm going to overthrow your government. And Absalom, sure enough, stages a coup and starts winning the hearts of the nation of Israel. Sure enough, a big insurrection rises up and overthrows David. David leaves the palace, heads to the mountains, to the hills for the fear of his own life. A civil war breaks out between him and his son, which ultimately would end up in taking the life of Absalom. David would move back to the throne, into the palace. Eight years later, at the age of 70, David died. And that is the greatest king in the nation of Israel's history. That's a guy who God said is a man after my own heart. It's interesting how you can win in so many areas of your life, but if you're not winning where it matters the most, does it really matter? So each week we've been giving you a lesson of what this teaches us, and here's the lesson I would tell you today, is that if you choose to do nothing, eventually you will have nothing. That's not just for the men, that's for the women as well. If you choose to do nothing, eventually you will have nothing. So what will you choose? And I'd compel you today, choose to play the man. How do we do that? How do we not end up like the royal family? Look at the verse again, three practical handles. This is what Paul says, it's right there in the text. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. First thing Paul says, you're gonna play the man? You've gotta be watchful. Men, it's this idea that you watch over your family, that you're looking out for things that are trying to impose on your family. You're, you're looking for things that your family's not looking for so that, so that they can run free as you watch and you protect them. Look, I, I listened to this interview a couple weeks ago from a reporter. He interviewed one of the leading pedophiles in the nation, this man serving a life sentence for his repeated offending. And this reporter wanted to get into the psyche of this obviously very sick man. And he asked him this question. He said, um, what were you looking for in a kid as you were targeting them? And he said, well, the very first thing I looked for was, is that child's father active in, the, in his life? And if that child had an active father, I didn't touch the kid. Men... Do people know that you are a threat to, to others that are trying to hurt your family? I'm talking about a threat in a good way. The only way that they're going to know that you're a threat is if you're actually present enough and active in their life for you to be seen that you are a threat. you gotta, you, know, you got to be watchful. The, the way that sin entered into the world in Genesis chapter 3 wasn't just that Eve took a bite of fruit. It was the fact that Adam stood there right next to her the, the whole time and did nothing. He stopped watching. So just in a moment of honesty, this isn't to beat you up. This is just a moment of honesty. As a man, as a father, as a husband, where are you not watching? And where have you allowed the enemy to start creeping in? He says you got to be watchful. Put the verse back up. Look at the next one right here. He says that you have to be, you have to be watchful. And then he says stand firm in the faith. 
this is why your relationship with Jesus has got to be pri- primary. What Ed was talking about, the triangle, that my relationship with God's got to be at the top and it's going to impact everything else. I've got to stand firm, not in my strength, not in my abilities, but in my relationship with Jesus. It, it, it's the reason why if you've never gone through our full life growth track, it's a, it's a nine-week discipleship course that we've created to give you practical and theological handles on what it actually means to live out this John 10, 10 full life that you've got to stand firm in something greater, something, something that your roots can go deep in. He says, stand firm in the faith. And then the final one is he says, be strong, but look at the end. Do it in love. That real strength is love. So, David dies at 70. No great relationship with his kids, but boy, was he really good sitting on the throne of the palace. He did what I think a lot of us do. We sit on the throne in certain areas of our lives. But when it comes to our house, we just circle the seat. And maybe you circle the seat because of things that you're dealing with. Maybe you circle the seat of biblical manhood because you're not really sure what it looks like. You don't want to let anybody down. And men don't really do things that we know we're not going to be good at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we just got a lot of guys just circling the seat that God has rightfully given to you. And I'm telling you, that's a seat of sacrifice right there. That, that seat is not for the faint of heart. That's a, that's a seat that puts the knees of others in front of them. This is a seat that carries the weight, that shoulders responsibility, that actively parents their kids, that raises up a next generation of Jesus followers. And I just wonder today, this, only you can answer this. Are you circling the seat that God has created you to sit in? And my challenge to you is to sit in the seat. And you don't got what it takes because you need Jesus and you need men, and you need brotherhood, and you need others to come alongside of you. But this is a seat, sir, that only you can sit in. So today, what will you choose? Because if you choose nothing, eventually, you'll have nothing. So let's take a moment. I just want to pray for all the men in the room today as we close. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, sir, but, but I believe in you. I want you to know that God, God loves you, not the version of you that you think you should be. God loves you right where you're at. Sit in the seat. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the fact that we have the greatest example in you, Jesus, of what it means to be a man. I'll tell you what is not what the world says. Like biblical manhood is not a line that you cross. It's a path that you walk. It's a relationship. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to mess up. Who cares? But it is about taking the position that you did. A God who is filled with compassion and love and tenderness, yet strong and watchful and courageous. And I pray over every man, every marriage, every father, that we choose to sit in the seat that you've created us for us to sit. We can only do it with you, Jesus. Surround us with great biblical men. We love you. We thank you. We praise in your name. Amen. Amen.